All right. So uh, today we wanted to come back and we wanted to come here and give you guys a, a case study preview. Um, like they indicated, Alan couldn't make it. He had unexpectedly came down with an illness, so it's really sad. So apologies for not being here. I'm going to do my best to cover his slides. Um, he had a demo at the end, and I'm going to do my best to do a short version of that demo as well. Um, let's see how it goes, and we'll go from there. Um, I do want to set a little bit of uh, context um, coming into sort of the agenda of us going into this case study. So for the last few, several years, we've been trying to sort of evolve the overall content experience for the IBM Cloud. And a few years ago, we decided to move our actual documentation to be sourced and marked down so that we could meet the developers um, in, in, of where we were trying to author, be more uh, collaborative with our SMEs, and then we also wanted to open source that content. Um, part of it is because we needed to do continuous automated delivery of that content. Um, and so based on all of that work, we started to look into our API docs and see if we could follow some of that similar model and take some of those patterns and learnings that we got from the docs themselves. Um, so about this time last year, um, we had been working on API documentation for several years, trying to get to this sort of seamless, um, integrated, single delivery site for all of the API docs across the cloud environment. Um, last year, around this time, we sort of reset. We wanted to relook at our architecture and our environment um, and see how we could, again, leverage that doc experience and the, the um, things that we've gotten from that environment to be able to easily, continuously deliver content. Um, so from that, um, we'll show you sort of how we were generating um, content um, for the API docs from Swagger 2.0, OpenAPI 3.0, Markdown, and integrating SDKs, which was a big thing that the Watson team really wanted as part of this, and several of our other services are starting to take advantage of. Um, and then we'll sort of show our environments. So as I mentioned, um, Alan and myself were here. So what we ended up coming and delivering is a catalog sort of view of all the API docs that we have available. Um, within the product itself, we sort of have this catalog view. Longer term, we're going to, I think, try and get to a, a developer environment. Um, but as, the, as you click through these, we start to go through and see, uh, see the actual you know, API docs themselves. Um, I think the last presentation was a good setup because we did exactly the same investigation of all the tooling that's out there today. Um, we're all trying to get to a similar standard. We all want to create these in, a, in an easier way. I'm specifically not going to be talking about the developer portal or the fact of the actual APIs themselves, but more of how I can create a good authoring experience for content folks that need to document these APIs. They have to leverage each other, but we need to be able to sort of meet where the writers need to, to supplement. And we've heard that a lot, I think, as it's gone on today. So when we first started looking at the problem, um, for myself, we actually have a huge volume and scale um, thing that, that we need to look at. I've got over 190 different products that deliver within the cloud platform, and each of those have their own individual sets of API docs, and they're separate content providers. In some cases, they might be actual developers that are doing the documentation for that particular service, and in other cases, we have full-on technical writers that have been bought, uh, hired on and are working with those service teams. But for our users, we really wanted to be able to deliver in a consistent way a single portal where they can go and access all of these. Um, we also had the issue where around when we were starting this up, OpenAPI 3.0 was about a year old. Um, so we still had a ton of people that were over on 2.0, but people were rapidly starting to migrate and wanting to use the 3.0 stuff. We're almost two years into that now, so we're getting more and more heavy on the 3.0 side. So we needed to be able to deliver an environment that was supporting both 2 and 3.0. Um, we've heard a lot, I think, today about how Swagger's great for a spec, but it doesn't provide all the additional documentation and content you need to understand that. So we wanted to be able to create some non-method, sort of front matter kind of material that would go along with the API docs, um, as well as giving extra capabilities to edit descriptions and examples um, as authors. And most importantly, we want to continue that open, collaborative environment with our SMEs and making it easy for them to author and collaborate together. Um, last piece of, that we, when they came to us, of uh, trying to make this easy, you know, I consider my customers, those that use the IBM Cloud, as one aspect of the customers. But because we have all of these contributing content teams within the company, those are my customers too. I need to make sure they have an easy environment for creating this content and an easy way for giving us feedback because they're trying to, they're invested in this portal as well. Their customers are using it just as much as I am as the overall platform. So we needed to make sure that we could increase their speed 
um, make sure they were delivering quality content. We were doing it in sort of a consistent, uniform way. Um, and then the idea of SDK started coming in. So how can we sort of do the single source implementation where we're writing it in one space, the API spec is the single source of truth, and we're leveraging that to output these different things. Um, so we talked, I think the very first presentation that was given was talking about analytics and metrics and those kind of things. We're also tracking those kind of things to see how we can make sure we're delivering the right content. Um, as, and so for the docs itself, I have a content quality dashboard where I run automatic, text, automatic test cases during build time to show whether that content is good or not. Well, I didn't want to do the same for API docs. So where we could, we implemented those automated test cases. We're tracking when was the last time this documentation was updated. We use a tool, a vendor called Acrolinks um, with the docs. Why not be able to use that with front matter and the descriptions that are within the API spec and try and get as good scoring on there as we can. Um, we've talked about linters with the specs themselves. Um, what, uh, we've got fellow team members that have uh, created actually an open API validator. Um, they've open sourced, um, so we lint that and run that. We as well lint the markdown itself um, as part of our build process to make sure it's good, and quali good quality. And then we check for things like broken links and if any like, feedback issues have been opened and submitted for the content. So doing that same thing for the, um, for the API docs, and then of course we're checking metrics on the actual content itself. You know, what's the most popular language being clicked on when they're looking, looking and viewing across the board on API docs, um, so on and so forth. But since we uh, delivered our latest implementation, which is towards the end of the summer of 2018, uh, we've definitely seen positive increase, um, a, a thousand percent increase actually in usage of our docs themselves. So we think we're going towards the right trend, and of course we'll continue to iterate and, and monitor this stuff as it goes forward. Um, so. This is one of Alan's slides, but I'm going to talk through it. So with the, um, where I was saying we're going to a single source and use a single um, swagger spec, um, this is sort of the DevOps view of leveraging the, AP, the, the open API swagger definition file. So as part of that, they're using a tool that they've built internally for creating the SDK. They're writing information into that SDK information that's custom per language. Um, and then combined with the open API definition file, they'll commit that content. It'll go through a continuous integration where it validates that content. It's actually generating the SDK, but at the same time, we're also generating SDK reference information. I'll be back to that one on the next slide. Um, they go ahead and create the language SDKs, they do automated testing on those things, and then they have publishing for, via a continuous delivery process. So similar to DevOps, we have content ops, right? We want to make sure that we're delivering this in an automated, um, automated way of the content as well. So that same open API definition file is used. The purple circle is that SDK reference information that was generated from the previous build. Taking that plus the front matter information that we're writing for that non-method extra content, we merge all of those things into a GitHub environment. From there, we do our continuous integration. It automatically kicks off the build. We'll validate the definition. We'll validate the markdown doing those test cases. And then we go and merge those things together and create a generated API doc. We'll do our automated testing with the test cases, and then we publish their continuous process into our API docs environment. Okay, so components of the authoring as they start going through things. I've touched on this one a little bit with Markdown. We really wanted to leverage Markdown because we've moved the overall API uh, cloud docs to Markdown. The Canonte contributors were very familiar with it. Um, we've done some things with our markdown. We've also created a markdown generator that we've open sourced for the IBM Cloud, so anyone else can pick up that as well. Plug. Um, but uh, so with those things, we've done minimal extensions to the markdown with things like attributes, so we can uh, tie things into certain locations within the UI, leverage CSS at runtime for showing those things. So since our writers are very familiar with that, we wanted to continue to leverage that. The developers are very familiar with that. They can review it with us. And so we do that to either manually create the content and assign it, um, and what Alan could have talked about a little bit more is their team has taken a step forward um, where they've created templates as part of their SDK writing, um, and they go ahead and generate the markdown front matter too. Um, we use the open API definition and those extensions, um, creating example files. Um, we can also define what's going to be hidden or exposed as part of that. And then the new piece is this sort of JSON blob that's part of the SDK generator. That's that extra stuff that we were saying is the custom documentation per language. And I'll show you that and show you in a minute how we can switch between languages showing 
different requests, different examples, but we're also changing the middle column of our API documentation based on the language to switch out this SDK specific information so that we have specific parameters for those languages or updated content. Um, we've done a lot of work um, as well to add some common extensions. So like I was talking about earlier, the whole goal of this is to make sure our internal cost customers have a great authoring experience and a consistent way of doing those things. So we created a few extensions that enable folks to do um, consistent things within the UI. Um, this SDK exclude will um, let us indicate whether we want a method or a property hidden um, that would have been built as part of the SDK, maybe we don't publish as part of the API. Um, the operations are you know, specific request example information that we can put in the middle or right panes. Um, if we don't want to try it out for a specific endpoint, they can turn it off or they can turn it off for the whole thing. Um, and then there's some actual replacement things that were custom for, for some of our pieces. Um, so for front matter, this is what sort of our temple looks like. It's very standard markdown markup. The stuff that's uh, sort of circled with like the, from the config file or from the open API extension, that's if that was generated from, um, from the tool that Alan had, had built. But the specific things that you want to note um, for just anyone that was authoring manually is the part that's in the middle, where we just simply use the standard attribute extension that we've created with our generator where I can say which particular programming language and then where do I want this particular content to display. Is it in our middle column that's sort of explaining um, the overall documentation and the different parameters, or is it in the, the overall example column? And then this is what it looks like. Um, so when we build these, um, the, that same markdown content, like I said, would actually go and document the stuff that's in the center column of us. This is that extra information that you'll need to understand the overall API, and then the pieces even on the right-hand side of uh, specific examples and samples. Uh, you'll notice that the left column or navigation is also built from this markdown piece. Um, if we have standard areas that we want the front matter of that extra information to where we want to make sure everyone is consistently documenting things like authentication or versioning or how they're doing error handling. So we want to make sure those things are included and then in the same consistent order that our customers can buy them. And then this should be some very uh, standard uh, Swagger or Open API definition markup. Um, if you were going in and coding in a, a specific language example, um, you know, using the format that was there, and then over on the right-hand side is how that uh, would print out. Um, we did want to also call out some other things and how they're, where they're pulled in from the Swagger spec and presented within the UI. So like open API summary, that's what ends up being the title of the endpoint, both in the center column and over on the left. We leverage the tags that come with open API 3.0 to sort of do grouping of like endpoints. Um, and then other various um, parameters uh, within the, the spec. And then here's the standard example um, uh, this uh, for like a 200 error, and then this is sort of what it would uh, display again within the UI and how we're pulling it out and pushing and publishing. And then the fun one is these request examples all within the same um, open API definition file. The example on the left is the curl example. The one on the right is what we would write and mark up in Python, for example. Uh, and then this is sort of um, a demonstration. If you pay attention to the left, middle, and right columns, you'll see them change based on which language, programming language we're selecting. Um, in some cases, we might not have a uh, specific front matter for that language or we definitely want to switch out the instructions in the center column, we want to switch out the examples, or the, you know, over the right you'll see exactly how to go and maybe download the SDK and get started uh, for that particular language. So here's Coral, um, I switched over to Python, same, same API, uh, same documentation, you'll see that something switched between all three. Um, here's another example in that same API with error handling um, in curl, if I switch it over to Python, we have specific, and you'll also see that the parameters within the center change. And then I think we have one more. Um, same thing, custom model. This is what it's like in curl if I flip between all three columns. So sure. um, I think we have one last, one extra slide in here to also talk about how we can add some extra information about uh, expanded parameter examples. Um, we can add this extra information in the swagger, and we just want to make sure we display it. It's stuff that's not typically um, displaying over in the, the right-hand side. I won't use it all. 
All right, so one thing I did want to do is a little demonstration to show you guys how um, continuous and fast this is. So hopefully the demo gods are smiling down on me. Let's see how this goes. Um, so if we come out here, let's try and make this bigger. See it. I'm logged into one of our test environments. This is our visual recognition API for uh, one of our Watson services. Um, I have already, this morning, gone in and just cloned the repo, where the same uh, Swagger spec is uploaded, the markdown file, and all the definitions for it. Uh, if I come into my Atom environment, I'm just going to come in and make a change. Maybe we'll say API, the docs, Chicago, rocks. And then just to show that we can switch between languages and build this quickly, I'm just going to search in here and find on code. Um, okay, so let's go and see this real quick. Should I switch this over to Python? Um, you can see this line of text right here, the example on this tab is provided for Python. We'll come in here, right there. Um, Chicago. All right, I'm just gonna save. I'm gonna just use GitHub Desktop. It notices my changes right away. Just commit that, and I'm gonna push it. So I'm gonna have to be the dancing monkey up here for just a little bit, but it's gonna be so fast it will be so impressed, I hope. Um, so the first thing that's gonna happen with this is I'll also go and jump out to our Jacobs environment. So in just a moment, we will see a build spin up instantly based on those commits. So we just have polling jobs out there listening. Every time someone commits anything in, whether it's to a markdown file, any file that's going into this repo, it's gonna go out there and, um, and pick it up. I'll do one quick refresh just to push it along. Um, as well, as, and, and so I'll talk through each of the, the sessions as it spins up. Um, I'm also going to open my, my uh, Slack channel. We have it fully integrated into Slack as well, so that anyone who's contributing and collaborating on this same repo, they'll just get a notification, hey, someone started a build for you. Um, so again, we're going to hope that our demo guys are listening, because we should see these posts. So essentially what it's happening is it's going, once the polling job hears and listens to the there, it's going to go and check out all that content. We support if the development teams want to use YAML or if they want to use JSON for the, the Swagger definition file. The YAML one, that's what this pre-convert stage is doing. It's just gonna go ahead and push it over to a JSON so we can convert it all together. We run our linters, which are both the open API definition and the markdown. Um, this API ref extract is taking that SDK reference content that was generated from the SDK generation and it's pulling out the pieces that it needs for the documentation. And then the build part is going to go ahead and merging all these things together. Um, once it's done, it's publishing. No, I'm sorry, it's lying down to me. But you can see how fast these go, <laughs> normally, um, with this internet connection. Um, we're not going to see it, I guess, today. But it goes through and publishes and cleans. Um, and then in less than two minutes, I was supposed to be able to come out here and refresh and see this. I tested it this morning, guys. <laughs> Well, I want to keep running and see if there's any questions um, I am at the end. I will say that um, next step for us is really to try and keep iterating on this. I think a lot of the things I've heard here is, you know, how do we get consistency um, in making sure it's a good API, right? This part was really all about how we enable the content writers to collaborate with the, with the, um, the developers and on those APIs. But as an ecosystem, <coughs> we need to do everything that you guys are doing. How do we ensure the API is good? How can I now take this instead of just an API reference library into a full-on dev portal, um, so on and so forth as we work our way through this stuff? Same question. Yeah, I have a question. Your, your, uh, your Jenkins file for Firefly is best work. Are your Jenkins file for the pipeline that's somewhere in GitHub that you're sharing? Or if there's an example pipeline out there you guys want to share? I don't have, I, I can look. It, okay. I, it's not out in the public one. Okay, thank you. We do have plans to do um, a pattern for our content ops um, and that full pipeline, not just for these APIs, but also for the docs. Um, I get that question a lot because we've been doing a lot of continuous automated delivery, um, not just outside of IBM, but inside, because we're such a big company, there are a lot of different divisions, so we do, I, I hope by this summer, to have that fully kind of, uh, that pattern created and published. Anybody else? Okay, 
you may have said this and I missed it, but is this the the actual site itself? Is that running on Slate or is that a, a tool that you built yourself? It's a tool we built. It's a node-based microservice that we deploy into a good environment. Hmm. Wait, I wrote it down. Uh, you, you had a table that was green or red and documentation quality. I'm just curious how that how you <coughs> determine whether documentation is good or bad. This one. Yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so what I first did is I created this content quality dashboard for our just regular documentation. So for me, just like document uh, code needs to go through test cases and run to see if it's validated, it's good to even be published out there, we should be doing the same for docs. Um, I can't always be a gatekeeper. So my team is built, I have a team of developers, designers who create these doc applications, these API docs, and then it creates content strategy for the overall platform, but then we also have it right. But I'm not, you know, checking in on those 200 services that are delivering their docs. So we need some sort of automated gatekeeping for some of these things. So we worked, went and built basically test cases that run as part of that automated build um, and go through and, and check to these. And then we put thresholds, you know, based on um, the certain threshold of what we have for each of the test cases, then the colors change. Um, the cool thing about this is it's visible to all my executives that are out there. And uh, let me tell you, people didn't care when I would do a doc week and say, hey, the getting started needs to be in a certain format. But as soon as I started doing a test case that they weren't doing yet, and it was, they were like, I need to be green. How do I become green across the board? And now they have to pay attention. Um, so for these particular, um, we just, for each test case, we go in and decide what the threshold's going to be. So for like app release, you know, industry standard tends to be around 80. You know, to be a good green score. I think for PII, sometimes people want it closer in the 90s. Um, so we try and just use the standard. So I think 60 or above is yellow for us. Um, anything below that is red, and then anything above is green. For the open API um, validator that we run, zero errors, you're green. Anything above that, you start getting different colors. Something, things like that. Acrylon is, is a commercial product. There's also an open source. Uh, uh, yeah, but Grammarly is a, is a uh, good uh, example yeah. of a free. Version. And there's also test the docs, but that's that's like um, Grammarly and Acrylinks do like the grammar checking. Mm -hmm. And test docs is um, for like um, generic language and stuff like that. So if you, if you want to start doing all many checks for that, uh, so. yeah. And then we've customized them to do our own rule sets. So I you know I recommend everyone to do that specifically. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. like I said, if the demo gods will never smile about it, <laughs> uh, and if anyone ever tries to do a, a like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.